I think we're ready for the feature presentation. Are you guys ready? Yeah. Okay. Well, then, without further ado, using data in schools, an anatomy lesson. Hi, everybody. Uh, this is sort of a terrifying number of people. When I started this group with Derek, there were literally three of us. So, it was four of us. It was four of us. Or, sorry, sorry, whoever it was that I just forgot. <laughs> <laughs> so what this is teaching me right now is that uh, I should probably bail on stuff more often because <laughs> when I leave, I think I was holding the attendance down, actually. So thank God I betrayed Chicago for New York. Um, the main thing I've been doing for those of you who, who know me, which who cares, but like for those of you who know me, um, I haven't been doing any civic tech stuff at all since I've been in New York. The main thing I've been doing is um, meditating and like, you know, walking and doing, uh, saving some kids. So this is going to be all about what I've, what I've been learning about educational data with my friend Andrew Martin. And before you get all uppity and say, oh, these two New Yorkers telling us about data, we're actually both lab Chicagoans, so it's cool. Uh, don't worry about it. Uh, and uh, Andrew, I'll let you introduce yourself now. Go for oh, it. I was going to introduce myself later. OK, you, I'll let you fine. introduce yourself later. But Andrew is works with KIPP New Jersey. For those who have never heard of KIPP, it's a nationwide charter school network that helps low-income children get into college. At least that's the goal. And I've been doing some consulting with them, which is the only reason I know anything about this. And by the way, I don't know a lot about this. so. All of the vastly more qualified people uh, in the room, please call bullshit when I when when appropriate. Um, and the whole goal of today is not so much to talk about like, oh my God, what are we gonna do with technology and education, or like, oh my God, aren't you know, let's let's talk about charter schools and neighborhood schools. Like, let's not do that <laughs> at all. What I'm going to talk about today is simply what data is gathered right now in school districts across the country, and what are some people starting to do with it. Just like as a starting point for discussion, because I've always wondered about this stuff. And it's really hard to learn about this stuff. This group tends to do a lot of a lot of work with city data, right? So, where are the fire hydrants, and where did the crimes happen, and who paid paid off whom? But it's you don't end up seeing a lot about education from the inside because, for very good reasons, student data is federally protected by laws. And uh, on that note, everything you're about to see is either totally fake data or not personally identifiable. This is something that's very important to note because. There are laws, and we're very serious about following them. So um, uh, the first thing to keep in mind is most schools are run by something called a school information system, which is an incredibly unsexy term for the piece of software that replaced the file cabinet and the grade book in a school. Right. So how do people know what, who even attends your, your local elementary school, and what, what grades are people in? And did, you know, ha has Timmy been in suspension? That all goes into this piece of software that I'm about to walk you through. So, um, Eleanor Eater is a real Chicagoan, uh, but all this data, again, has been faked. And uh, Eleanor was born. It's not a birthday either. Ooh, that's my birthday, you know? I don't know, I don't know your kid's birthday. Don't, don't put me up to that. Um, so, Eleanor is going to graduate in 2031, which is insane uh, that that's the future. Uh, she's a, a nice white lady, and there's no such thing as a free lunch. And she goes to Logan Square Elementary, and that's the address of Longman and Eagle, just in case you're wondering. Uh, <laughs> I did this on the plane. <laughs> um, <laughs> so the first thing that goes into an SIS is enrollment. Who even goes here? Like, who, who, are, the, who are the people? Who are the people who go here? And, we, and so the, the, the actual records in the database and in the spreadsheets that power the software basically look like this. Ellie is in kindergarten right now, no one is here, and then she'll be in preschool, and then she'll be in whatever. And maybe she left the school, and so there would not be a first grade record. Um, so this is uh, one of the main things, one of the main reasons that you, you gather this data other than just to know like which kids go there is so you can do demographic reporting. So anytime that you see a number like, oh my god, um, Chicago schools are losing a high percentage of their black students or something like that. That number, that aggregate number, originally came from like individual rows in tables in databases in schools, right? It's like there's a spreadsheet in the school that tracks all the kids, and uh, Ellie is white, and that's why we can report a larger percentage about that school or that neighborhood or that city. Does that make sense? Um, 
And, and so you end up being able, like, these are the kinds of questions. This is, this is why this data is even tracked. So you can answer questions like, how many students go here? Anytime you're asking that question, that's coming from the SIS. Or like, similar question I just said, what is the change in Hispanic students in schools in the northwest side of Chicago? It's gentrifying, so that's probably going to be reflected in the school student enrollment demographics. So next up is courses. So uh, Eleanor is like really <laughs> smart. <laughs> How old is your daughter now? Like three? She's like 18 months. Yeah, this is pretty pretty impressive. Yeah. Man. Um, so she's really she's really precocious and has some really excellent uh, teachers. And um, this is all going to get recorded in that SAS as well. For the, the whole time she's going to be at that school or other schools, we know well we don't know, but the schools know what what she's taken over time. Um, can I throw, and, can I throw yeah. one thing about that? Yeah, please. And like one of the reasons that this has become super important is all the legislation that tries to tie student uh, academic progress data back to a teacher. You have to know which teachers match to which schools. And it's actually like a harder problem than you might think because there's lots of like small structures inside of a school. So, uh, like young Miss Eater might get reading intervention with a teacher in the morning, and how do you apportion her reading progress across? The multiple teachers who work with that student during the day, like that, all comes from stuff in these records. Um, yeah. So ignore these simple questions because apparently there are fancier questions that, <laughs> that <laughs> I didn't know. I didn't know. About this. Uh, uh, attendance. Remember when you used to go to school and you were late and then you would get smacked by a rod by a nun? That was my school. Um, perhaps at yours, the, the teacher just politely like marked down that you were late, and that gets marked down every single day in an interface that looks kind of like this. So this, these are students here that have been whited out, and for each student, you can say, you know, they were tardy or they were late or whatever. So anytime that somebody says, hey, what was the attendance rate this week? Which, by the way, all principals ask. This is one of the main reports that they pull week to week. Um, this that's how you can even know those numbers and. Back in the day, it used to be taken on paper. Now these things are mostly digitized. And this ugly, ugly interface you're seeing comes from PowerSchool, which is the nation's leading student information system. Um, it was designed, it was built as a, go on. So I'm going to get this mostly wrong. Um, it'll live on YouTube forever. But my understanding is it was like started by like some high school students as a school project, bought by Apple, bought by Pearson. So you can imagine the like legacy design decisions that happen when you have a system that was like started 15 years ago, bought by three other vendors, um, like and that's like what powers a lot of schools. For example, there's a mother field on the students table. So like every student has a mother, you write that down. But what if you have like another mother, you switch mothers? There's no way to record that. There's a lot of really bad design decisions in the piece of software that. Uh, catalogs the educational lives of some disturbingly high percentage of students in the United States. Yep. Uh, I just want to know whether the public can get at this if it's if the names are redacted essentially. Like if if, if they remove the name column and the and the uh, date of birth and the social columns, can can we ask for can we FOIA CBS and ask them to generate this report for us from their system? Which report? This report? No. Uh, any of this. I well, so this, that, I'm asking because it matters, right? So oh. if all you're doing is saying, hey, give me the count of Asian students at uh, Logan Square Elementary, they can probably tell you that unless there are very few Asian students, in which case it gets great. But if it's individual level records, right, like per, what's called personally identifiable as a way to tie it back to you specifically, you can't. The like general rule that gets used, and this is not like written down in like a federal law anywhere, but there's like worries about in a multi-dimensional cube, right? Like if you know one fact over here, you can then sometimes read across a row and subtract away and infer another fact. So schools are really hesitant to ever release things where the n is more than is fewer than like ten or five, because you don't know what else is out there, and even if like what you did release is not that big of a deal. If it's matched up with some other record, you could inadvertently disclose something that you wouldn't want to disclose. And because you're dealing with like kids, right? Like you can't even like have a lot of kids who are under 13, like the laws are like very specific online, like you know, like you like kindergartners, right? So the like the, the privacy interests are heightened when it's a five-year-old. 
And anytime that you have data that looks like this, like the only people who are going to get a spreadsheet that looks like this, that don't aren't employed by a school district, is probably going to be someone like Nick, who's an economist and who has a deal with with uh, CPS. And if he gives me this data, he goes to jail. So you can probably a lot of times you get counts, right? Like schools are more more apt to give out counts than they are individual records. This is what it says. CBS's official policy is that the original can be used to make Do you know where that comes from? Does that come from state law or does it come from like policy? CBS district policy. Uh, the, 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 that's also a requirement of FERPA, which is the Federal Educational Rights and Privacy Act. Is uh, also says it's a 10. What language what, is that? What is FERPA? Is that? <laughs> is FERPA Greek? Is that what that is? <laughs> <laughs> I'm all about giving helpful languages. <laughs> You're about to marry a Greek woman, so you should be able to I, translate for us. It's the most complicated equation. Most complicated equations on earth. Is for the book of Greek, yeah. So FERPA is a federal law that is is the federal law that prevents <laughs> basically us from being able to get these us being the public from being able to get these records at the individual level, at the level of actual students. <laughs> so you'll hear that tossed around a lot, and it's a very good law. Let me keep moving on. Um, courses we did that. Attendance we did that. Uh, great. So <laughs> she's probably not going to follow in your footsteps. Though, I'm sorry. Um, so uh, uh, yeah, great. Report cards terrible. I got straight C's until basically senior year of high school. But we need them for a reason. Uh, what's the reason again? Because I would kill grades if I could. Explain. Um. <laughs> <laughs> See, nobody knows. We just do these things. It's like kind of like we have grades because we have report cards, and we have report cards because we have grades. Yeah. Right. Um, right. But I mean, like, it sounds facetious, but like, I honestly think that like that's not a decision that's been like sort of thought through from first principles in a lot of schools. Like, what information do we give the students and parents? Why do we give it? And like, has anyone ever done any like user experience testing on does this information get to the outcomes that we want? Like those are questions that if you work in the web, that's like your first instinct to like, oh, I have this information I'm giving out. What's the click-through rate? Like, what's the rate at which it's like, <laughs> like, does something that I want somebody to do? Like, who's even opening this email? But like schools like have a thing that they do and they kind of do the thing and there's not great information on how well it's received and like the feedback channels are kind of broken. So it's hard to even know like how to make this, some of this stuff better. Yeah. Hey, so we, we do grades to sort of say how you did in the class, right? So you can get to college, so your, so your parents can get on your case if you're not doing so well. Um, but the problem with grades is that they're, they're just a ton of variance, right? They don't actually, in theory, they capture how, much, how well you can meditate, but in practice, they kind of have to do with what you did at the time. Yeah. Um, but whenever, whenever you have a question like, how did all the kids in eighth grade math do on a weekly quiz, that comes from this thing called the grade book. So the grade book is, imagine a big table where every column is an assignment. So every, every assignment, or every quiz, or every test you take, and every row is uh, a student. It, it used to be an actual physical book where teachers would go through, you, the one teacher in the room, is that, do you still do it by hand or do you do it in digital? Uh, digital. Digital. It used to be you would actually write down Timmy got a you know five out of ten on the quiz and da da. And so grades, this is where grades actually come from. Um, and you can start to ask questions like uh, you can ask big questions like what's the average GPA of the entire sixth grade, or you can drill down and say how are the kids in that reading class doing on that one assignment. The problem is, and we'll get to this this theme in a second. The problem is that you can't really compare outside of a single classroom most of the time. Because even within schools, different teachers will have different assignments. So ideally, what you want to be able to say is, there's, take, a, take a skill that, or a concept that a student should learn, like how you divide fractions. You want to be able to, or how you multiply fractions. You want to be able to, um, to know how the kid is doing on that concept and how, how that ability compares to all their peers across the whole country. But if the only data you gather is some assignment called, you know, dividing by fractions, and they got a 10 out of, out of 11, some of the teacher might have done totally differently, and you really can't compare those numbers. Does that make sense? So this is why we have testing. 
everyone hates testing, but there's a reason we have to do it. Otherwise, we just don't actually gather, like physically gather, that much information on what kids are learning without tests. Um, before we get to tests, um, there is, you know, whenever you got called into the principal's office for acting out, that used to go in a file cabinet and hopefully burn someday. Not anymore. It gets tracked, and the reason it gets tracked is for reasons you'd expect. So that you know, if you if it's your third infraction, they can call your parents and talk about it and so on. And one way that this actually gets used, like in real life in schools, is we have social work teams, we have counselors. Um, and one of the like early indicators that a student might like need additional supports is there might be like sort of behavior problems in class, right? Like student might be acting out. What is the cause of this student like acting out? A lot of times it's a student who has needs that are not being met. So that can be a way to sort of like flag students for additional supports is to look at the patterns of discipline, office referrals, and to see if those students are like, you know, getting the kind of supports that they need from the school. Okay. Uh, this is what the power school interface looks like for actually typing this stuff in. Um, okay, so now we're getting into the world of test scores. So everything we've talked about so far are just very broad strokes. What kids are going there? What classes are they supposed to be in? Did they show up that day? And what are, how are they doing on the, on the assignments and quizzes that are assigned in class? But that doesn't tell you that much about um, the actual learning that's occurring, which is what you want to know at the level of the school, at the level of the classroom, so the teacher can say, uh-oh, you know, Eleanor needs some extra help dividing fractions. I'm going to focus on, on that today. Up to the level of the whole country, how are we, you know, every time you say we're falling behind on education as a concept, that has to come from some, some test somewhere. And so th this is all about the technology that captures those tests. <laughs> okay, before, before we actually get to like what apps are used these days, because they don't really do Scantron anymore, but some, some districts still do, but a lot of them are moving away from the Scantron. Before we get to the technology, there's a really important distinction that I had no idea existed um, before I got into this thing. So it's the difference between an interim test and a summative test. Interim tests are tests that you're given halfway through the term, whether it's the quarter or the semester, half, just along the way. And the whole point is so the teacher can say, okay, he's actually doing pretty well in Algebra 2, so that's great. Or, uh oh, my, all my students seem to be failing this one concept. I'm going to focus on dividing fractions. Does that make sense? It's primarily to drive instruction is the jargon that people use. Summative is end of the year, end of the quarter. Here's all the stuff they were supposed to learn in this term. Did they actually learn it, or how well did they learn it? And it's mostly used for, um, for at the school level, it's used for kind of planning the whole next year school year. Um, and at the state level, these are state tests. So remember taking state tests in schools. If you if you were unlucky enough to have to do that, that's what I, that's what those are. Um, so Eleanor's record is she she's been taking the math test. Um, math test we'll talk about in a second. I sat as the Illinois state test. Smarter Balance is a common court that's about to come out, and ACT is how she gets into college. Um, when No Child Left Behind happened, one of the requirements was that, um, that states had to measure how well their kids were doing, so they started to implement a bunch of state tests. The problem was because all the different states taught different things, they literally had different curricula that they were, that they were different sets of ideas that the kids were supposed to learn. It's really hard to have everyone teach the same test because it won't cover the same stuff. And so that's why the idea was, okay, you guys pick your own tests. So that's good now because we can see how uh, Eleanor is doing on reading compared to all the other children in Illinois. But what about all the other kids in the United States? It's only a small percentage of the population. So if you've heard of Common Core, the like really short version of what that is and why people do it is let's get as many states as possible to teach the same things. Same, like, literally, these are, we're going to teach the same sets of concepts in fourth grade math. Um, and then, now that we teach the same things, we can, we can use the same tests and, and actually start to do comparisons. Um, so, Smarter Balance is one of two new Common Core aligned tests that are going to roll out. Of course, we try to standardize what happens. People create a, an, an extra standard. So, uh, right now, not every, not, every step has adopt, not every state has adopted the Common Core. And they're actually two separate tests that are dueling for, for dominance. So that's awesome. Um, uh, go America. Um, so do you want to come here? Yeah, so um, like if you've ever heard results talked about in the Chicago Tribune, that's probably like the result of an ISAT test, um, at least for the past 10 years. 
that's probably been driving headlines. Um, these tests like tell you some things, and they're like you know really like internally like our people outside of the school care about these a lot. So we care about how we do, but they're definitely not the most instructive thing in helping us plan because the results tend to come so time lagged um, from the date of the actual assessment. So some of the most useful things that these tests produce are like growth scores, like, you know, so there's like a, does this student like meet like some sort of standard of like what's considered to be a proficient seventh grader? Like, okay, right, like, are they past this point or not? But then also like, did this student grow from the previous year to this year? Like, you know, is this student getting like good teaching? Is like good, is, is teaching and learning happening in the school? We only got our growth scores in December for the tests that happened last May. So we're halfway through a school year, right? Finding out whether or not a kid grew last year. So these are really important, but they're not the sort of most important thing that we look at during the school year, but because of the sort of, it's, it's so like, there's such a big production to do these because there's like so many requirements, it has to be the same in every school, and there has to be test security, it has to go to a company and they have to ver verify the results. These tend to be sort of very drawn out um, for like an internal school consumer. So, so no child left behind. We have a bunch of state tests, but two problems. One, I, the one first problem I already talked about, which is that um, we can't compare across states. The other problem is you can't really compare across time as well. What you really want to be able to do is like. You can imagine you're learning as a path, right? So the more you learn over time, you learn some stuff. And this is the path to get you to college, going up here. Someone who's exceeding that path is like even steeper growth, and someone who's not doing so well, and then maybe it gets better, would look like that, if that makes sense. And if, 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 we, had a, if, if we could have like this view of, of academic growth, then you can do, start to do interesting things. You can say, is, how does a student compare to the path that they need to get into the state school? into a very selective school, into an apprenticeship program. And you can also say, okay, it's sixth grade. How is this student doing compared to all the other students in sixth grade? Pardon the like my name, but there's no blackboards here. Um, and this is what the VAT test does. It's another, another test. It's different in that um, districts can choose to use it. Not everyone does. It's not like a state requirement. But it starts to get at this question of, where are you on this path? So. The kindergartners, and, and so you have a single score across time that, that falls. So you're actually going to, like, your score will keep going up as you learn more things over time. Does that make sense? Across your academic career. And uh, that means you can actually start to, to compare, like, wow, this third grader is at, is at the reading, has a reading score that, like, the uh, fifth graders in, another, in, that, in that other neighborhood do. You see what I'm saying? You can actually, like, get the whole picture of academic growth. The other really nice feature about having data like this is that you get really like good data about uh, growth expectations for students across the proficiency spectrum. So kids who are really far behind are going to tend to grow more than kids who are really high up on the spectrum. There's just like compression effects. Like if you're already at the top of a scale, your sort of absolute number of points that you grow tends to be not as much year over year. So you can, if you have, you know, sort of a diversity of, of learners in a grade level, and every school does, you can start to figure out for any individual student, you can compare them to their peers nationally, like sort of what is the expectation for a student who's in third grade and who's performing at the 15th percentile. Then you can then sort of start to do growth metrics for every individual student to really make sure to see if your school is like reaching all kids. So that's one of the big benefits of having a bigger comparison pool is it lets you make um, inferences about how different kids are doing that um, you couldn't otherwise make. The problem, though, is that if you are a district that wants to start doing math, that's one more test you have to do. Because right? it doesn't get you away from doing the state test. You have to do the state test, and then any, and then you can you can do math several times a year if you'd like. You could do it in the you know in the fall, winter, or spring. But then the kids are like, oh my god, too many tests. So it's a constant trade off of like sort of the cost of knowledge. Right? We need to know something about what's going on with the schools, and some tests are clearly better than others, but it's also not, you know, teaching to the test happens and kids get over-tested, absolutely. So the question is, what's that, how do you strike that balance correctly? And no one, I mean, that's, it's a political issue. 
on public. Yeah. Just so that test in particular, the map, just there are many people who are going to know this, or probably many who don't. That is the test that CPS currently uses to hold schools accountable. So all CPS students take that test at least once a year in the spring, and then schools are rated and held accountable to that standard. All schools, like regular schools, charter schools, uh, option schools. Is there Oh, is this taken by every grade level? Um, it is required to be taken by grades two, well, two through 12, two through 11, maybe. I forget at the top end, um, but not for the younger kids. But you could. There is a, a form of math test for case and K and one as well. Is this data published in aggregate? Yes. It's available on CPS's website. If you look up the acronym CPS and the acronym SQRP, which is a school quality ratings policy, you will find a web page uh, that has all this data uh, in aggregate at the school level. Yeah, uh, there's also a CPS web page which uh, has information about the assessment schedule in terms of what is required, what the different assessments are, what's assessed at different grades in terms of you know, like, you know, school readiness, early reading, and then like the state you know, tests that are used for accountability. And assessment is just a nice word for testing. Whenever, whenever like education people love to say assessment instead of testing because it sounds nicer, but that's, what, like, that's what that means just when you hear that word. CPS administers the NWA map to uh, and not all secondary groups, um, but then they also, in some schools, you know, their purpose administer the NWA MPG to keep their MPG. Right, yeah, the MPG's map are primary, right? It's got a little bit different interface for students. They're on the same time. Yeah, they're on the same scale. So the idea, right, is that you're on the same scale. It's like taking the GRE. You take the GRE when you're 21, you take it when you're 15, you take it when you're 30, you're going to get a value on that scale depending on how much mathematics you know. So it's using the same kind of theory behind it to, to estimate those things. Sorry. It's computerized, right? It's, yeah, it's yeah. adaptive computerized test, just like taking the GRE nowadays. So this is the other big thing that's changed. It used to be everyone got the same test and you scan from it up. Now everyone sits in front of a, a laptop and they shuffle the questions kind of randomly at you, right? Sort of, yeah. So yeah, so not everybody sees the same questions on this test. It's like we all take the same form, right? Like your test might look different than my test might look different than Derek's test because the the goal is to is to um, place you on the scale, not to give feedback on the individual items that you did or didn't answer. It's like the um, it's, yeah, it's like the it's like the GRE if we went as ever taken taking that test. Like that. Yeah, as you can tell, it's just, like assessment is a whole world. It's crazy. There's like whole people. This is a whole field of, of research and practice. Um, when you, um, and then these things that you have to suffer through are literally the only role. Of these things is to get key for college. So this, this is so colleges can be like, not those guys, yes, these guys. That's it. It's the only point of these things. They don't measure how much you know. They, they're just gatekeeping, in my own opinion. Um, OK, so now I'll get to that. <laughs> <laughs> I think you should look back one. Yeah. Um, something that people might not be totally aware of is that some states have started to use these as a way for high schools to see how they're doing. So they're in like Louisiana. You don't have to score a certain score to pass high school, but you do have to take the ACT. Like you have to sit down and take the test because Louisiana thinks that that gives them um, some valuable information about how their high schools are doing. For high school data especially, um, high school is the first level at which kids can really like exit the system, right? Like kids can drop out of high school or they can elect to not take some of these assessments. So you do have this problem with some of this data when you try to compare it from school to school that the, it's a self-selecting group of kids who took the test. So you don't always know if school A is doing as well as school B because school A, you know, might have had like only their higher kids take the test. So some states have adopted these sorts of things as graduation requirements to try to figure out how their high schools are doing. But these tests, the, 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 what I said earlier was super glib and I realized that. The reason I said it is that um, th these tests are all about college readiness, which is like its own idea in education versus academic growth. So they're like, you hear these terms tossed around a lot, and really it's all about like, are you ready for college? Not, not specifically, not originally anyway, do you know what you need to know? In terms of sort of like um, marginalized populations wherein you sort of either 
are still enrolled in school but sort of incarcerated at the same time mm -hmm. or just sort of go the GED route. Is that also captured in this database, or are there sophisticated parallel databases that also track you if you just deviate in many ways for many reasons from the system? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it's the, the question was if people near the back, like if you're if if you're uh, incarcerated or if you're in some sort of alternative education program, how is that captured? Um, if it's run by the district. Right, it'll usually feed into as many of these systems as possible with some sort of workarounds to account for the fact that you know students might be getting a different curriculum or might be in a different setting. So uh, if it's part of the public system, usually this stuff is driven by state law and a lot of, to whatever extent possible, you'll see those schools represented. And just real quick, in terms of global, like, like other countries that are doing this, like. Is there a point of reference, or is there a way that, like, a I don't know, kindergarten teacher can also see how Japan is tracking, how China is tracking? Yeah, next year. So there's, so yes. Um, the big difference with a lot of those international assessments is um, they're not taken. It wouldn't be like we all sit down and take the international assessment. It, they're usually done through statistical sampling. So the whole test for some of these like big international assessments might be like. 40 hours long to sit the whole instrument, but nobody sits the whole instrument. No, like they don't give it to the whole population of kids. They give it to enough kids to know that they have a, a score that represents what's happening in that country. And that test is literally only given, here comes my vast generalization again, but that test is only given so that the president can be like, we're falling behind on internationally. Like it's not really used, it's, used, it's not really used to drive educational content that much. It's just to say like, man, how are we doing compared to speed? Not that well is the answer. Um, yeah. Don't, in regards to the ACT, SAT, and AP tests, um, don't 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 the schools uh, keep track of how many kids got accepted into college, and what type of college? Yeah. So there's um there's like this like uh, clearinghouse of data that you can use to match kids um, who are in college, and that's one of the things that school districts do is they figure out like. Um, what percent of their students are going to college, and they do that by kind of like matching records in a national clearinghouse. But this question and the previous one get at two, the, the two big data problems in education, which are one, the data about you as a student is kind of scattered all over the place. So if you go to an elementary school, school in one place, all those records, like th those records come from teachers and, and business administrators typing them into the system, and then it just stays in that one place. You go to the next school, they start a new paper trail for you, but it doesn't actually migrate most of the time. Um, so if you want to do anything that involves having a complete picture of you across time and, and across different systems too, it's not just this, but like, say you want to know which schools actually ate, which students actually ate their free or lunch, that's tracked by several pieces of software, but it's not, it never ends up in one database unless you get it there. Um, so fragmentation of data is a huge problem. The other big problem is um, uh, what, does it, what happens after? Right? There's a big push now to say, okay, what's the point of college? Uh, what's the point of uh, education? <laughs> Free and slip. Um, what's, the point, <laughs> what's the point of education? Maybe it's to you know, live a complete life, but a lot of people say it's about getting to and through college and then into the, into, into, uh, into the, the labor market or whatever your goal is, right? That stuff, it, those outcomes happen years down the road. So the high school business administrator generally doesn't really go around calling students who graduated in 2007 to see what's go what's up. And if no one's calling and writing that down, the data just doesn't really exist unless it gets tracked by the colleges and you can get, but you see, you see what I'm getting at here? Our picture of what happens to kids largely comes from people at schools typing it in and it leads to this really kind of fragmented and incomplete picture. Yeah, I just, um, in terms of the international perspective and I'm gonna throw a little cold water on this, um, which is that if you look at some of the countries that have the highest scores, Finland is often brought up in the PISA exam, the international comparison, they don't, they don't do all of this data stuff that we're talking about. I mean, we all love data, but they don't test their kids the way we test our kids here in the United States. They do maybe one test, the whole, I think they have one test for the entire um, academic career towards the end, and they actually, for various reasons related to how they treat their citizens, they tend to do a lot better uh, overall. 
in their scores than we do in the United States. So I think that actually, you know, one of the things that you see there's a growing movement, for example, to opt out of the park test. You know, there's a growing movement against all the standardized testing is because it's actually has a lot of harmful effects. Yeah, there's yeah, there's a lot of variation in like national practices. That's yeah, if you look at the international, those some of those, are, and sometimes they'll also like ask questions about like school environment and school offerings, right? So like the international math assessments try to drill down and figure out like what's happening inside of schools. I'm running a long on time, so I'm gonna I'm gonna keep going. Um, um, the last new piece, and you're gonna focus a bunch on this, is uh, the internet. So I think we've all seen Khan Academy before. It's pretty sweet, and a lot of schools recognize that, and so they actually use it in inside the classroom. Uh, if you don't understand how to divide fractions, you can you can get a Khan soothing voice to explain it to you. Uh, <laughs> and the data that comes out is actually way richer, right? So it's gonna be and, and way more kind of surveillance state. It's like. At 8.13 a.m., Eleanor watched the matrix multiplication video, and like an hour later, she aced it. She aced that idea already. So what's cool here is you can, well, the good thing about this is you can actually start to maybe kind of get at more of what happens in the learning process. Actually, when are people trying to absorb lectures? When are people like working out the problems in their heads? Like actually starting to track this in a more granular way. So the big dream is like, oh my god, maybe we won't have to do as much testing because we'll be able to like, have a much more, a much richer, better, real-time picture of learning through the data exhaust of the software. Mm -hmm. But actually, like that's it's like a, it's the wild west. It, it, like any hype, you know, Huff Post article that says like ah, we're disrupting education is sort of bullshit. Like it's just, we're just not there yet. It's really hard. We might get there, but we're not there yet. Let's just skip this. <laughs> Um, hey, so um, and if if I'm not loud enough in the back, somebody just raise their hand. Okay, great. Um, so uh, Pablo, Juan Pablo asked me to um, like give a little talk from a school district perspective. Um, my name's Andrew Martin. I work for KIPP New Jersey. Uh, KIPP is a national organization. So if KIPP was a state, KIPP New Jersey would be like a school district. We run eight schools in Newark and Camden and we're going to 10 schools next year. So we have about 3,000 students in New Jersey, K through 12. Uh, we're a charter school. I've heard that you guys know about charter schools in Chicago. It's not, <laughs> not an unfamiliar concept. Um, so um, we, we can talk about that stuff later if you're interested in like the landscape of um, like New York schools. There was a New Yorker article, maybe you read it. Um, it's pretty interesting like what's happening right now. There's a, like just like very like it, it's you know you probably heard something about it. Um, I used to be a teacher. I taught elementary school and I taught high school, and now I do kind of the sort of field of work of sort of data science stuff um, for education for Kip New Jersey. So who uses data? Like why do we have all this data? Um, so the like least interesting or like the sort of like probably like. Nobody's like, excited about doing their like reporting to the state, but it's 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 pretty important to understand the school landscape that like this is the most like high stakes consumer of your data because like a they're the one who disperses the money for um, educating students. Like there's like local property taxes, but there's a lot of state aid. Um, and if you don't send your data to the state, they won't give you the money for like to like run your schools. And B, if you don't give the correct data to the state, you can either get like your school system can get shut down or your school system can get taken over, which has happened in like Newark and Camden. Um, so like one thing to understand when you're working with school district data or if you're looking at like sort of what happens in a school district is to remember that like school systems are super responsive to their authorizer. They're not necessarily super responsive to the other priorities that the open data community might have. Just like know that that's baked into the system, that you have to send your enrollment and you have to send your tenants, and you have to get that to the state and you have to get it on time. And that drives a lot of the purchasing, system, the purchasing decisions of the systems that are used. Um, so we do that, right? But that's like a couple times a year process. Most of the time we're thinking about like student achievement. We're thinking about teaching and learning. How's it going? So um, the people I talk to most of the time during the day are teachers and school leaders uh, in our region. So the kinds of questions that a teacher might be asking, um, so obviously they have like 
like sort of the sort of quiz and formative assessment data that they have from their classroom, but they also are like giving students assessments, giving students tests. They want to know if their students are growing. They want to know if what they're doing is working. So how many of my students grew a level on the last literacy assessment? Which of my students are on track to make their like yearly, yearly learning goals? If they're not on track, why might what might not be working and what could I do about it? So um, we use a lot of stuff that's in Tableau. There's like a data mart that we have that kind of intakes all of our system. It sits in our like school network. And then we do a lot of reporting directly to teachers through dashboards through Tableau. So there's, you know, like a whole data pipeline that ultimately gets to a teacher via data displays in Tableau. Also in Excel, also in PDF reports, but like this is one of the major pipelines that a teacher would see. Um, school leaders are also like major consumers of data inside like the school ecosystem. Um, so they're usually like asking questions a level up from individual students, usually trying to do sort of like patterns across a school. Um, so questions that a school leader might have is, you know, grade level subjects, like what patterns of achievement am I seeing? Are there individual teachers who are showing success with students? And then are there like programmatic things that we need to change? Like is ACT prep not working? Should we be doing SAT prep instead? Or is the fourth grade math intervention program not working? Do we need to change it? And that's the kind of stuff that they would be like kicking off year over year. So they're often asking me questions like, is X or Y working? Should we keep doing Khan Academy? Should we stop doing Khan Academy? Um, so some of the stuff that we do is we build reports for those consumers of data. So like you might want to know how the sixth grade is doing at one of the schools and like giving some insight into growth and sort of overall progress is a big part of like the job of somebody who works in a school with data. Um, we also think about students as being like a really important audience for data and like that's, I want to just highlight it. I don't have a ton of time to talk about it, but I think it's like a, it's not something that people, I think, give enough time and attention to, especially when you think about a student's like K through 12 career. Like our memories of high school, we don't think about like, oh, my ninth grade biology teacher was the determinant of whether or not I went to college. Like we often think about like our own like beliefs, actions, like how we were interpreting what was happening at school. So like talking directly to kids, like giving kids the information they need to know their own progress and to and to sort of design systems that encourage students to keep going, right? Like there's this whole social psychology, like uh, research around um, mindsets, right? Like if you have a, a growth mindset about your own learning, if you believe that like your brain is malleable and like learning is something that um, your intelligence can be changed, that failure isn't a sign that you're a failure, but that failure is a sign that you like have things that you need to learn, like failure is a waypoint on the way to knowing. Um, that can really change like how you interact with school, that can change outcomes for kids. So we try to think about like, how do we answer the questions for the 3,000 kids in our district? How do we answer those questions at scale? Because there's only one of me. And while I know many of them, and I've taught some of them, I don't know all of them, because there's just so many of them. What's my long-term path to college? What can I do to influence my long-term goals? What are my kinds of careers am I interested into? What kinds of colleges am I interested into? And if I'm interested in, you know, an engineering career, and I want to go to New Jersey Institute of Technology, what's the kind of learning trajectory I need to be on to get me to where I need to be by the end of high school? So we do some reporting to students, right, where it's like, if this is where you are in fifth grade, what sort of scores, like what's a growth path that gets you, what's an individualized learning path that gets you where you want to go if getting into Rutgers is something that's like a big priority for you? Um, so like, what does all this mean? Like, what are the big questions that like people who are doing policy or if you're like uh, in the open field community, like what are just sort of uh, Juan Pablo and like thoughts about like what the state of education data is right now? Um, if I had to like kind of like summarize like what has changed and what's new, um, you can kind of put like a lot of school data on like a like a scatter plot, like a two axis thing, right? Where like on the bottom you have like how frequently do you get the data? And then on the vertical you have how relevant is this data? Like how valid is this data for understanding a student's like growth? Like how reliable is the data? Is it like, is it, is it kind of mushy or is it like pretty crystal cold about like how a student is doing? 
So you have like a lot of data right now that's low frequency, but like really specific. Like the state tests tell you really specifically where a kid is. Like there's a lot of work that goes into really trying to make those tests as precise as possible, but they only come once a year. And then you have a lot of sort of high frequency data where it's harder to know what it's telling you about if a student is like on a track to college, but you get a lot of it. So that's like grade book data, like a quiz in chemistry class. It's picking up a lot about a student, but it's hard to sort of like, it's hard to use that data to understand the student's like absolute progress or understand how a student is doing relative to their national peers because it's so specific to the context of a school. So there's kind of been this like question of like, well, is there any source of like high frequency, high relevance data that we can get? Because like, I actually like our school system, like the over testing problem that like you brought up, it's something that um, like, you know, I think that like, um, the like the normal dialogue is that like, well, I don't, I don't want to presume, right? But like people sort of stereotype somebody in my role sort of saying like, oh, you're obsessed with testing kids, right? You just want to reduce kids to a measurement. In fact, like I'd rather like not test kids I'd rather like, because like testing isn't learning time, right? Like the, the test is just an instrument to hopefully get you some useful information to design a better academic program. So if you could live in a world where the information that you needed to design the school experience was coming in and you didn't have to do so many tests, like that's fantastic. That's the world we want to live in. Um, and like I think that hopefully like five years from now, this world where more stuff gets instrumented, this world where like during a writing lesson or during a math lesson, you probably interact with a computer and you probably answer some questions that can be viewed in a sort of far bigger context than just your classroom <laughs> will give us a chance to get more high frequency, high relevance data. Um, that is not happening right now. Um, because this stuff is so new and there's just like a lot of work that needs to happen. So when I started teaching, when I taught fourth grade in the Bronx in 2004, I probably had like three or four like really like informative data points that told me how my kids were doing uh, like on a sort of like absolute national scale where I really knew if they were ready to go to fifth grade. And like now with some of this data from Khan Academy where it really does tell you has a student mastered like fractions, like has a student mastered like, you know, uh, linear algebra or whatever the objective is, like there's like hundreds of points of information a year, but there's no sort of framework or system or tool that equates that data together and tells you how a student is doing like on that sort of big picture question that you really care about. Like is this student on track to achieve their goals? Is this student on track to be able to go to college? Um, so the open questions that I wanted to sort of like share with you is we have a lot of data we still don't have enough people doing this work to generate the level of insight that I think that we'd want to have. So there's like this like really baroque world of um, like testing science. It's like test theory, item response theory. It's, it's, it's very interesting stuff. Like if you ever remember taking the SAT, you probably remember that you like took like an odd number of reading and math sections. Like you took like one extra section. The reason you took that extra section is that one of the sections wasn't actually counting towards your score. It was just a set of items that they could use to sort of like make sure that the test form stayed the same difficulty level over time. So that the SAT that you take in 2004 is the same difficulty as SAT in 2015. But all of this math, like there's just like books and books and books of this stuff and it's super interesting. All of it assumes that the student is like static in time. It's like we're giving this like one test on March 3rd and like where is the student at that moment in time? What it hasn't developed is how is this student's like learning like developing over the course of a year? Like there's this like parameter that you're trying to estimate and the parameter is changing over time and you're getting information from it, from data from like Khan Academy. Like how do you sort of build uh, tools and statistical models that do that? There are things out there like Carnegie Mellon, um, if you're interested in this stuff, is like absolutely at the cutting edge of this stuff. A company called Newton, in New York City is also at like the cutting, cutting edge of this stuff, but we have all this data. We're not really able to use it to, to get the level of insight that we would want to get to really know how our students are doing from the information we have at hand. And then the other like kind of big open question I think for this world of like education data is like this is a school org chart. It's an out of date CPS org chart. Like where does data science sit on this org chart? 
Like, is it research and evaluation? Is it IT? Is it its whole new vertical? Who needs to hire for it? What are the tools? What are the practices? Who should it report to? These are questions that like have not been settled yet because there just are not a lot of people that have like the title or the sort of like like sort of reporting responsibility to get to answer those questions. You see it with like some of the like the research and evaluation like community is the, is like like probably like the closest thing you have in big districts, but you don't like the sort of structures that exist in a web company don't exist in like public institutions yet. And like, where do we stick this thing? And how do we um, try to answer some of these questions? Um, I did a search today um, and there are 25 uh, schools on GitHub, like in the whole country. You know, there's however many thousands and thousands of school districts. There's very little presence here in this sort of like like open web, open government web, where all these schools are consuming the same kinds of data, they have the same types of questions, but they're not, there's not a community of practice. It's like sharing this information out. Although I will highlight that when I did this search, uh, LAUSD joined on March 2nd. They joined yesterday. So like <laughs> that's that's a good sign. Like I'll take that. Um, so maybe like one thing to take away for today is I hope in five years we have better tools for answering some of those questions from the con data. And I hope in five years, when I do the search for how many schools are on Git, the answer isn't 25 in a country this big with this many school systems. Um, the last thought that I'll give you, um, if you're sort of like coming to this from the startup community, one sort of common thing that I've heard people say is like, oh, the stuff that schools do is crazy. They have these old antiquated systems. And the systems are super antiquated. Like when I taught in New York City, the way that we gave information back to the, the city and the state was through this system called Automate the Schools. And there was like a old school modem with like a phone jammed into like the two receivers and it had a dedicated phone line up in the like uh, in the attic of the building. And if that phone line went out, like nothing could happen. Um, so like people look at this and they're like, let's like, if you haven't read this article, I know it's like New York Magazine, like maybe not like, you know, everybody's cup of tea, but it's really, really, really good about sort of like the excesses of the sort of, you know, uh, the, the laundry app ecosystem. She just has this like beautiful passage in there that I kind of wanted to close with where she talks about how um, people that try to sort of like go in and sort of like change these established systems end up getting like mired in the intricacies of those systems, like these like laundry startup guys that like wanted to like make laundry something they didn't have to worry about now know more about like industrial washers and dryers than any other human being on the planet does because they own laundry startups like if you want to contribute to this my suggestion would be not to sort of like try to like knock all the other stuff off the table because there's like reasons why this stuff exists there's like you have to get your information to the state the state has to know how many kids go to your school the state has to know what their attendance is but there are lots of open problems that need solving so think about uh, answering some of those problems before you go this route. And that's all my slides. <laughs> <laughs>